So there are two main types of fat tissue. Um, white fat is what we all understand by fat, and this basically stores energy in fat. Uh, it's also involved in appetite regulation and metabolism as well. But the other type of fat tissue is something called brown fat. Uh, and this was thought to evolve when animals came out of the sea onto land. And around this time, one of the biggest threats to survival was actually hypothermia. Um, so in, in these animals, uh, this tissue evolved to burn off energy to release heat, uh, to maintain the temperature of, of the body. Uh, now, um, up until, so if you look at uh, small mammals like mice and, and rats, they have lots of brown fat. Uh, because they've got quite a large surface area to volume ratio, they're susceptible to losing a lot of heat. Uh, so they're susceptible to hypothermia, uh, much more than elephants, for example. So for that reason, small mammals have lots of brown fat, and we've known that for decades. We've also known for a long time that when we're first born, uh, as neonates, we ha we're born with a, a pad of brown fat between the shoulder blades. When you think about it, this makes sense because obviously we're not born with any clothes on and when you're born you have a very large surface area to volume ratio so you lose a lot of heat comparatively and you're set up susceptible to hypothermia. So it makes sense evolutionarily to have uh, brown fat uh, when you're first born. What we've understood for many years now is that as we, as we go progress through babyhood into early childhood, we thought that that brown fat gradually disappears. And then as adults, you don't, we don't have any. But then a few years ago, uh, a few studies showed that in fact, in at least some human adults, um, there is, there does exist active brown adipose tissue, brown fat, which was quite a revelation at the time. And it's kind of, uh, it, it's turned the whole field uh, on its head really, because now we have a tissue which we know exists in at least some human adults, which has the capacity for facilitating weight loss. Why is that? Well, if you imagine a tissue which burns off energy and releases heat, this is burning off calories in the form of sugar and fat. And of course, that would then be expected over time to result in weight loss. So we have here a tissue which, um, if, if uh, stimulated in some way, could over time potentially help with weight loss and could also help with sugar levels in the blood and fat levels which are being used up in this kind of burning process. So that's really where the therapeutic excitement of uh, brown fat uh, uh, stems from, uh, really. So this gives you an illustration of uh, the potential of brown adipose tissue. Uh, if you imagine a sugar cube size of brown fat, uh, if you stimulate that over the course of a whole year, it could actually burn its way through around three or four kilograms of white fat. That is around, say, uh, six or seven pounds of, of white fat. So in theory, you don't need lots of brown fat to actually have a uh, potentially substantial effect on, on weight over time. So in terms of where we are, um, in terms of therapeutics, this, uh, as you can imagine, is still very much, this feels very much in its infancy, certainly in terms of human brown fat, that is. Um, we're nowhere near developing therapies uh, which uh, stimulate brown fat, but I would envision that over the next 10 to 15 years, perhaps, we may have developed therapies which do actually stimulate brown fat in at least some of us, which could help with weight loss over time. There are some important unanswered questions which remain, one of which is how many of us actually have brown fat, and we don't know the answer to that. Estimates are that perhaps up to around 50% of us may have some degree of activity in our, in our brown fat, but it's quite possible that all of us, given the right conditions or right stimulants, may have uh, active brown fat, we simply don't know yet. We also don't have an accurate means of measuring brown fat through imaging or biochemical means, for example. And I think this will be important to develop if we are going to be de developing therapies which can act on uh, brown fat. In terms of the environmental stimulators, that the main one really is cold exposure. So in cold temperatures, uh, we know that um, we're more likely to activate our brown fat. And we know this from various imaging studies which have shown that very clearly. And when you think about it, that makes sense because clearly if you're in a cold environment, you'll want to shiver and you'll want to produce heat. And we know that brown fat does exactly that. It burns energy to, to release heat. That's what it evolved to do. So it makes sense, does it not, that if you're in a cold environment that you would activate your brown fat. Now clearly, 
we need to be cautious about public health messages around this because we don't want to be telling everyone to turn the thermostat down because obviously there's risk of hypothermia and so on. But we do know that if you are exposed to a slightly colder temperature, uh, you will burn off more energy. And one of, the, one of the reasons for that could be simply activation of brown fats. Now, in terms of other stimulants, um, we, we know that certain foods can activate brown fat. Uh, for example, chili uh, can, can do that. So uh, when we eat a hot, cu hot curry, for example, uh, in some people, um, we think that they can activate their brown fat. And this is related to pain receptors in the mouth, which are activated by chili. And via a certain nervous pathway within the body, this can then stimulate brown fat to produce more heat.